I want to introduce Michael. He's been, uh, like I say, since 1968, involved in elections, studying elections, studying campaigns, studying polling. He's been kind of a pioneer in some of the polling research, which has uh, really taken off. I actually remember in 1964, uh, and I guess the election was 63, Michael. I, I was uh, at Ferndale High School in Detroit area, and the polls, uh, I was a newspaper boy, and I remember reading on a Sunday morning that Kennedy was polling ahead of, uh, of his opponent, uh, Nixon, I think, at that point, and that uh, I was very really excited about that. There was about 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning trying to deliver the newspapers and opening them up, and seeing the poll that Kennedy was ahead. In Ferndale, I was kind of the minority uh, in terms of pr supporting Kennedy. Uh, and as I look at my Ferndale friends on Facebook and places like that, I see I'm still in the minority. So, uh, you know, I don't think voter patterns have changed all that much over the years. Maybe that's one of the things you could talk to us about, Mike, about what determines who, how people vote. So uh, Mike and I have known each other for a long time uh, through the university, through our kids and, uh, we have sons about the same age. So uh, I'm going to, it's my pleasure to turn things over to the esteemed, uh, well, I guess Professor Emeritus in the past, but now you're actually at, back at the university. You can't stay away. So uh, Michael, take it away. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Thanks for the um, invitation to be with you all this morning. Uh, um, I want to uh, make this presentation, as Rob said, for about a half an hour, then I'm happy to <clears throat> answer questions for as long as you're uh, interested. This is a uh, very unusual uh, political campaign in terms of what we've seen uh, recently in American politics. It's uh, important, uh, I think, to begin by, by, by positioning the Trump presidency in terms of what we think of as the normal uh, presidency or a normal incumbent seeking reelection. If we go back to 2016, <laughs> it's important to uh, remember that Donald Trump has no prior experience in governing. He, he ran as an outsider, promising to drain the swamp. Any observer of Trump across the last almost uh, four years or a little over four years counting the campaign <clears throat> will know that he has very little interest in policy. And in fact, some people in the media have described his presidency, at, uh, his term in office as post-policy government. He, he doesn't believe in science. He, he governs from his gut feelings. He uh, stretches the truth frequently, and sometimes he actually lies. One thing that's unusual about Donald Trump is that almost every other president who gets elected and takes office immediately begins to think about how uh, he can enlarge his coalition. And Trump has never expressed any interest in doing that. He is focused entirely on his base and, ho and holding his base. One thing that's different in 2020 compared to 2016 is that, of course, he's an incumbent, and therefore he has a record to defend. He had a campaign strategy prior to the onset of COVID, which was to run on the basis of uh, a strong economy and then to turn out his base. But of course, uh, the onset of the pandemic has uh, changed Americans' views of what they expect from government and also altered the nature of the competition. So as a political scientist, when we talk about uh, understanding elections, there are um, four factors that we take into account. One of them is, uh, what's the division of partisanship in, in the constituency? So when we think about the presidency as a national election, uh, which might or might not be appropriate because of course, as we know now, the president is not elected by the popular vote, but uh, what's the division of Democrats and Republicans in the country? 
How are the candidates being evalu evaluated as individuals? What are their main policy differences and how are, is that seen or, or perceived in the electorate? And will there be differential turnout? One uh, candidate's supporters being more enthusiastic and likely to vote than the others. So I want to begin by talking about partisanship. These are some data from the Pew Research Center. Um, when we measure party identification, which is a concept that actually was developed at the uh, Survey Research Center at Michigan in the 1950s, we ask two questions. Uh, one of them is, in politics as, uh, as of today, do you think of yourself as a Democrat, Republican, or an Independent? And in the top part of this graph, you can see that the, the, the partitioning of these responses is relatively even. Uh, uh, I use the standard colors throughout the presentation of blue for Democrats and red for Republicans. Um, in the latest readings, there the country is about one third independent, one third Democratic, and uh, about three in ten identifying as Republicans. There are a few people who refuse to identify. But then, in a second question, we ask the independents whether they lean more towards the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, and then we get this this two way split, and. Uh, there's about a five percentage point advantage of Democratic identifiers over Republican. So we, we think of or describe the United States as a, a Democratic nation, although the analysis of voting patterns by party ID show that Republicans have been more likely to vote than Democrats and they have been less likely to defect to vote for a candidate from the other party. The other thing that's important to understand about partisanship in the United States is that the Republican Party is a party supported by white Americans. Uh, in these latest data, um, the, among whites, 53%, a slight majority identifies Republicans, 42% as uh, Democrats. Uh, but um, among African Americans, it's eight to one favoring the Democrats. Uh, among Hispanics, it's a little better than two to one favoring the Democrats. And among Asian Americans, it's about, about uh, four to one favoring the Democrats. So this is a, a, an important set of data because not only does it describe the current situation in the United States, but it's important to keep in mind that the demographers estimate that by the mid 2040s, whites will be a minority in the United States. So there, is both the current state of division by race and ethnicity and partisanship in the United States, but also the trends that seem to uh, be working against the Republican Party. Uh, I mentioned also that the evaluations of the individual candidates are important. And uh, we call these traits, per, uh, personal traits. And I use uh, colored arrows, again, red and uh, blue, to illustrate uh, the responses from a survey that was completed just uh, in the last couple of weeks. And you can see that uh, uh, Joe Biden has an advantage over Donald Trump, 33 percentage points, as uh, being seen as compassionate, more compassionate, more likely to be compassionate. Uh, 26 percentage points, uh, more likely to be seen as a good role model. 18 percentage points, more likely to be seen as honest. Uh, there are only uh, two of these traits in which Donald Trump has an advantage, a small advantage, uh, being perceived more likely to be mentally sharp by four percentage points, essentially uh, even and standing up for what he believes in, eight, eight percentage points. And uh, compassion and empathy have been uh, a, a major advantage 
uh, for Joe Biden as the pandemic hangs over the entire United States, the rest of the world. The same kind of uh, questions can be asked about uh, broad policy areas, although I think that this campaign uh, on both parts has been relatively policy free. Um, who, uh, how confident are you, very or somewhat confident, uh, that each of the candidates can make good decisions about economic policy? This is the one area where uh, Donald Trump has had a slight advantage uh, and pretty consistently. Uh, but as you move down through uh, effectively handle law enforcement and criminal justice, select good nominees for the Supreme Court, make good decisions about foreign policy, uh, people are more likely to believe that Joe Biden would be uh, better uh, with regard to those policies. And then when we turn to handle the public health impact of the coronavirus outbreak, the Biden advantage is 17 percentage points. And bringing the country closer together, he has a, a 20 percentage point advantage, uh, about the same on these, on these two important issues that are related to both the pandemic and also the divisive nature of uh, the Trump campaign. I mentioned uh, something just a moment ago about uh, the racial and ethnic division of party identification. Uh, generally, party identification is a great predictor of uh, who you're going to vote for. And if you look at the results of uh, presidential elections going back to 1976 up through 2012, um, you can see that the Republican candidates have been favored by whites in uh, every one of these elections. The average advantage is about 14 percentage points. In the Clinton, George H.W. Bush campaign, it fell to two percentage points. Uh, in the um, Barack Obama elections, it was uh, around 20 percentage points. If you look at the exit poll data from the 2016 election, you can see that um, Donald Trump had a 21 percentage point advantage among whites. Uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton had an 80 percentage point advantage among blacks. Uh, in 2012, the turnout rate for Barack Obama among blacks was actually higher than the turnout rate among whites. So here are some data again from this most recent Pew survey. Uh, and it, this is a table of demographics, but I highlight again uh, this uh, division of support by uh, race among whites. 51% say that they uh, will support Trump and 44% say that they will support Biden. It's a seven percentage point <clears throat> advantage. This is consistent with Trump's election and also with the history of the voting patterns going back to 1976. So where, where, does the, where does the campaign stand today? Well, the chart on the left, which is taken from uh, Nate Silver uh, last night, uh, shows, first of all, that the race has been uh, pretty uh, steady in terms of the division of preferences uh, going back to the summer. And currently, uh, this is a modeled estimate based upon national polls and some other uh, elements. Joe Biden stands at 52.4%, Donald Trump at 41.9%, a 10.5 percentage point uh, advantage or lead uh, for Joe Biden. But we know uh, that uh, in, in two of the last five elections, somebody became president who didn't get a majority of the popular vote. And 
uh, for those of you who are in Ann Arbor, uh, under the Electoral College and, and what is generally a winner-take-all rule, we know that Donald Trump became president by uh, fewer votes across a few states than sit in Michigan Stadium on a Saturday afternoon, about 88,000 votes. And he won the state of Michigan and all of its electoral votes uh, by 10,000 uh, 700 votes, less than 11,000 votes. Um, so it's, it's important to uh, keep in mind what the polls are saying in these battleground states. These are the states where uh, the, the, the candidates are spending all of their time, their personal time. That's the most important uh, resource that they have as well as where they're doing their heaviest advertising. And uh, you can see that uh, in, in Texas, uh, uh, Donald Trump is uh, still maintaining a lead uh, as well as in Georgia, although it's essentially a dead heat. But in uh, eight of the other battleground states, Joe Biden is ahead. And in the upper Midwest, his, uh, his current leads are uh, pretty sizable, seven points in Michigan, three, six points in Wisconsin, nine points in Minnesota, also seven points in uh, Pennsylvania. Ohio is too close to call. Th these are states that Donald Trump won in uh, 2016. And this is one of the major reasons why uh, the, uh, Biden campaign uh, seems to be ahead. So why might the uh, outcome of the election be closer than the polls, either the national polls or the state polls are currently showing? What can happen in the last couple of weeks? First of all, the campaigns are being run in very different styles. Uh, Joe Biden has almost no field offices because he or his campaign uh, is respecting the conditions of the pandemic and he's not holding large rallies. And uh, in a kind of a reversal of 2016, he has organized his campaign primarily by uh, telephone and social media. They're not, uh, the, the, the Biden supporters, the field work for the Biden campaign is not being done by door knocking. On the other hand, Donald Trump has about 300 field offices. You can see how they are uh, strategically located uh, with regard to the battleground states and how they are uh, very prevalent in Florida and in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa uh, and in North Carolina. In the 2016 campaign, uh, Donald Trump had a superior uh, social media uh, advertising and organizational scheme. And uh, the man uh, who organized that, who was responsible for that, Brad Parscale, became his campaign manager for 2020. Uh, but then he had uh, a, a, a difficulty in producing a crowd for a, a rally uh, and was replaced, eventually had a, a kind of a personal trauma and now he's dropped out of the campaign entirely. So continuity uh, has been a problem for um, the Trump campaign. But it's important to note that when people look at the registration data, the new registration data, the number of new registrations that is in the last uh, year or so favor the Republicans. That's partly due to this uh, field operation. The Democrats, for example, in Florida used to have over a 500,000 advantage uh, in registration going back to 2008-2012. Uh, 
now their advantage is down to 150,000 registrants. Um, one strategy of the uh, Trump campaign is to hold these large rallies, which, which energize uh, the president, obviously. But if the president's campaign is organized on a combination of stimulating turnout among his followers at the same time that uh, there's an attempt to suppress uh, voting by uh, the supporters of uh, his opponent, especially minority uh, voters, um, we can expect to see that the president is back on the road now after his hospitalization. We can expect to see him build to um, perhaps three or sometimes four rallies a day by the last few days before the um, election. If you are following the news of the last 24 hours or so, you will know that Bob Woodward uh, uh, played another piece of audio last night uh, in which uh, Trump describes his strategy of uh, large rallies and the generation of enthusiasm to produce high turnout. One interesting point from this recent uh, Pew survey is uh, the differences in preferred or actual uh, methods of voting by the supporters of the two candidates. Um, in, the, in the Pew survey, overall, there's a 10-point advantage for uh, Joe Biden over Donald Trump. But you can see that among the people who uh, say that they intend to vote in person on election day, there's a two to one advantage for uh, Donald Trump. While uh, for those who vote by mail, uh, the advantage is about uh, two and a half times for uh, Joe Biden. And there's a slight advantage for Biden among people who intend to vote uh, in person before election day to go to an early voting site. I believe that the estimate as of today is that there have been 16 million votes cast already in this election. And of course, a person's vote is secret. We don't know for whom these people uh, voted, but we do have an indication in some cases of what their registration status was. Uh, in the places where you have to register by party. So uh, a substantial portion of the votes cast already are, have been cast by registered Democrats to the extent that we can tell that. So you may hear uh, the use of the term banking votes. Uh, Joe Biden has been banking a fair number of votes uh, already in, in the early voting but we expect that there'll be a big difference between the uh, division of the votes cast on election day and the division of the votes cast uh, before election day. I wanna mention another advantage that uh, Donald Trump has. This comes from work by a colleague of mine, Stuart Soroka. This is the relative proportion of uh, the news coverage uh, in, in the beginning of September, at the start of the campaign that each candidate received. And uh, short of 2016, you can see that there's an incumbency advantage. Uh, the, the blue dots are where um, an incumbent Democratic president had an advantage. And uh, the red dots show where the Republican candidate had an advantage. Now, 2016 was an open contest, but you can see that there was disproportionate coverage for Donald Trump in, in 2016. He has a particular strategy that he uses um, uh, to garner uh, media coverage. And at the beginning of the 2020 campaign and, and actually uh, continuing, about uh, seven uh, or a little more than seven out of 10 mentions that uh, appear in the news have Donald Trump's name associated with them uh, compared to only two and a half uh, for Joe Biden. And um, 
not all of this news is good, uh, but to have uh, this kind of advantage in, in uh, mentions, uh, first of all, uh, has a slight ad advantage for Trump, but it also means that people can't learn very much about Joe Biden because of the lack of coverage. So what are the candidates' basic strategies? Um, all along for Donald Trump, it's been to energize his base by appealing to racial and ethnic divisions. He's, he's focused on these uh, wedge issues of, of uh, law and order. Um, he has uh, associated himself or refused to disassociate himself uh, from some uh, very divisive groups in uh, uh, contemporary American politics. His campaign has uh, very little policy content associated with it, uh, except for talking about how well the, the economy is doing in terms of the stock market. And his claims, of course, that uh, we've turned the corner with regard to the pandemic. He and some uh, Republican uh, operatives, uh, people who are responsible for administering elections in the states, uh, have made uh, a, a number of attempts, mostly successful, to suppress turnout by making it harder to vote. And he has begun a campaign to, to raise questions about the validity of uh, mail-in ballots and also uh, the accuracy of the count and therefore the final outcome. Um, for Joe Biden, he has remained positive and empathetic uh, he, he emphasizes his personal characteristics directly and indirectly in relation to Donald Trump. He's been promoting policies, uh, for example, with regard to uh, climate change without an explicit contrast between his positions and Donald Trump's. He just talks about uh, how uh, climate change is, a, for example, an existential threat. Uh, to people in the world. And of course, the Democratic Party is uh, emphasizing turnout. Um, one final point about the election, which is, uh, I think, very important, is about um, the doubt that's being raised uh, about the integrity of our electoral system. Uh, and whether, we don't know yet whether this will be uh, a one-off thing associated with this particular uh, campaign under with these two candidates and under these particular conditions, or it will have a more durable impact with regard to how Americans feel uh, about their political system. So here are four questions asked in a, a, a YouGov survey um, for Yahoo News in the middle of September. Uh, and this is the um, percent of people who responded yes by uh, uh, support for a candidate. So do you agree or disagree with the following statement? The only way Donald Trump is going to lose in November is if the election is rigged. 11% of Joe Biden supporters believe that, but 61% of Donald Trump supporters believe that. Do you think this year's presidential election will be rigged in favor of one candidate or another? One quarter of the Biden supporters, half of the Trump supporters. Um, election security experts say a US presidential election cannot be rigged. Do you believe them? And you can see that this proportion is, uh, is relatively low, uh, at, at least with regard to what people might have uh, expected. Um, one in, uh, one in uh, seven Republicans believe this, one in three um, Democrats believe this. And then finally, do you think this year's presidential election will be free and fair? And here there isn't much of a partisan division, although the explanation or justification for these views could differ by party, but only about one in four survey respondents thought that this year's presidential election will be free and fair. So those are the comments that uh, I had um, prepared. 
and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start by uh, thanking you, first of all, and, and asking you a question. And then I'm going to have people break into small groups for about five or six minutes to form their questions uh, as they talk to each other. That's part of the Leaders Connect connecting uh, aspect of this morning. But my question is, uh, what are, with two weeks to go, two weeks plus, what are you going to be looking at primarily? What are, what are, what are the... Uh, what do you? What will you be following? What polls? What uh, what trends, uh, et cetera? Well, I um, I tend to follow Nate Silver 538.com. I think he has a pretty good model. We know that in uh, 2016 the national polls were were very good, but we know that they uh, accurate. That is. But we know that there was a statistical bias that favored Donald Trump uh, in the state level polls. Uh, they showed Hillary Clinton ahead when she lost uh, many of these states, even by a small margin. And he, uh, Nate Silver produces these estimates at the state level as well. And the, the New York Times has a, a kind of a data division called the upshot. And I, I follow the data there. Um, the lead that Joe Biden has is historically a large lead at this point in the campaign. And one thing that's very interesting about it is it's remained about the same size since the summer. So <clears throat> the, the, and I thought the contrast between the two candidates, for example, in the uh, dueling town halls last night, you know, was pretty striking. Um, the main thing is turnout, uh, whether the Democrats can produce voters and whether the Republicans can, uh, minimize Democratic voters while stimulating the Trump, uh, supporters to get to the polls. So I'd be watching, uh, the early voting trends and I'd be watching the polls um, there is one more debate next week. My guess is that when they appear jointly, uh, it's not going to be very different than the first debate, the, the relative performance and behavior of the two candidates. Uh, but, we'll, but we'll have to see. Um, there are things that could happen that, uh, you know, are unpredictable. I mean, if the president had gone into the hospital three days before the election instead of, uh, you know, a month or five weeks, that could have had an impact uh, on, on uh, the distribution of preferences. Um, and of course, nobody's out of danger yet. Uh, uh, Kamala Harris is going off the campaign trail for a couple of days because there is coronavirus among her staff. Uh, we, we'll have to see whether she uh, can do virtual events, um, but th there's not much room for change in preference. It's really about whose supporters get to cast their votes. Okay. Well, thank you. We're going to take about five minutes and just uh, have people in groups of three uh, introduce each other, introduce yourselves to each other, and, and maybe think about a question you might have from Mike or, or something that is... Uh, on your mind that you want to uh, express. So, uh, Emily, take us away to the uh, the magic uh, chat rooms. I'm going to ask uh, Diane Buis uh, oh, to, uh, to ask a question. Uh, to, to Mike, Mike, are you back there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Diane uh, has the, uh, the honor of being a first-time voter. She just got her citizenship, and this is her first election. So uh, we all thumbs up and claps for Diane. And she has a question for you, Mike. I appreciate that. Good morning. Um, so I am a first-time voter, became a citizen just about a year ago. And so it's, it is exciting to, to be voting. It's also a really interesting time to be voting. And one of the things I was wondering about is, um, is there can I uh, show up to a polling place that is not mine? I've heard conflicting information to observe uh, just because we've heard um, 
potential threats of violence, um, p voter intimidation of of uh, of people who want to uh, intimidate voters. I would I would. Uh, be able to or, or want to do the opposite, the, the non-intimidating observance. Is that, and, but in my own district, I am not worried about disturbance. I'm worried in, in, about potential other districts. A, am I allowed to? And B, where should I go? And thank you. <clears throat> so first of all, let me ask you where you live, Diane. I live in Ann Arbor in Burns Park. Okay. Um, um, you know, because the the administrative and regulatory atmosphere is different from place to place. It's not really easy to go and observe uh, because the polling places, for example, aren't set up with uh, chairs under ordinary circumstances. You know, you couldn't just come in and sit for half an hour. And especially under the conditions of the pandemic, um, I think that the poll workers may be sensitive to um, loitering, but I'm not sure. In Ann Arbor, you're as likely to be able to do this as any place in the country, uh, because we have a local clerk uh, who is um, qu quite open about uh, the way that she administers elections and quite tolerant of, uh, I, I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, I'm gonna call this unusual behavior. <laughs> people, lo people loitering at the polls. Um, so I, I think that you could do it in Ann Arbor. It's, it wouldn't be true everywhere. Um, it, it wouldn't be easy uh, to do, but you might be able to tell me what you think you would gain from this. Appreciate the question. Uh, I uh, said in, in Ann Arbor, I do not expect major uh, disturbances, but I yeah. could uh, imagine in some areas not very far from here um, that uh, more voter intimidation or attempts to suppress people's vote. Um, by um, trying to intimidate people at bef as they enter or before they enter a polling station, things like that. And so that that would be something, I admit that as one person showing up, I may not make a huge difference, but if more people think like me, and I expect people to think like me, there could be a difference made. And that's something uh, I, I, I would be potentially interested in. And so that's really our, so if an Ann Arbor, the clerk, is open to that, that's great. But I would be more interested in a more uh, contested area. And I, I'm not sure if that, if, if that is possible. Uh, well, thanks, Diane. We're going to go on to uh, Matt Auerbach. Um, Aberbach, I should say. Matt, uh, you, you're also there. You have a question for us? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Connie and Thomas and I were, were chatting, and one of the fundamental questions or questions we have is looking back at 2016, Mike, and uh, the polling data and the, the ultimate conclusion, right, that happened, disappointing as it was for, for many. Um, is there, has there been any major changes in the science of polling as a result? Has there been any, you know, um, uh, you know, anything that we can look at this polling data and have a bit more confidence um, going into 2020? And, and, and ultimately, was there a root reason for the 2016 margin of error? Um, this, this is a real interesting question. It's a little hard to answer, but I'll try. Um, <clears throat> every pre-election poll involves a set of assumptions, starting with who are the people in the sample who are most likely to vote? So um, you, you know that uh, in, in the United States, we usually have only about half of the eligibles who go to participate. And the pre-election pollsters have to estimate which half of their sample or 60% of their sample are, are the most likely ones to vote. And then look at that preference uh, distribution. And these likely voter models involve a set of assumptions which often aren't made public. 
uh, one important assumption is, is the electorate this time going to look like the electorate last time in the same kind of election? And, you know, that's a common assumption, uh, which was uh, a bad assumption in 2016, because the relative participation by urban and rural residents was different in 2016 than in the previous elections. Turnout went down in the urban areas and went up in the rural areas. And there was also a slight difference in uh, uh, preference by levels of education. So that uh, people with higher levels of education, college degrees or, or, or more, became more democratic and people without a college degree became more Republican. Um, <clears throat> we, we learn these things from the exit polls and then, you know, subsequent analysis of uh, the actual returns. So this could be uh, adjusted in 2020 either by, you know, modifying the sample designs or by changing the weighting uh, procedures. And the pollsters are going to try to do that based upon what they learned and, and are doing that based upon what they learned in 2016. But we don't know whether this electorate, especially under the conditions of the pandemic and, and uh, mail votes and so on, is going to look the same uh, as the 2016 electorate. So, you know, there's clearly some interaction between these assumptions, often unstated, and what actually happens across, you know, across the election period. Uh, I don't remember whether I mentioned this before, but in 2016, the estimate is that 42% of the votes were cast before election day. And currently people are estimating that in 2020, maybe 60% of the votes will be cast before election day. And that is going to, you know, that's going to change the composition of the electorate. One thing that's interesting about some of the pre-election polls, both nationally and statewide, uh, some of the firms that are doing the polling is that they're now producing three estimates. One is for average turnout, one is for low turnout, and one is for high turnout. And ju just as, you know, political scientists believe they understand the electoral system, the low turnout uh, estimates are relatively speaking uh, more Republican. They favor Trump. He, he may not be ahead necessarily, but the Biden margin is smaller. And in the high turnout uh, scenario, the Biden uh, lead is larger. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see what turnout actually is, how the, how the election, uh, how the electorate actually gets formed and what impact that has on candidate preference. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Annie, uh, you're out there still? You had a question? Yep, uh, I do. I, I was um, with a, in a small group with Matt Graff and Gretchen Driscoll. And as we chatted a, a bunch, um, one question we came up with was, what is the direction of the, gen the younger generation, maybe 18 to 25 or so? What direction do they lean? And what is their turnout expected to be this, um, this election? Well, young people, are often the kind of holy grail of political candidates. Uh, there, is a, there is a relationship between age and turnout propensity. Uh, the the uh, older you are, the more likely you are to vote until you get to be uh, uh, a senior citizen. And then for a variety of reasons, your turnout might fall off. Um, when we look at uh, attitudes, about public policy or, or uh, policy preferences. Young people are more liberal uh, than uh, the older segments of the population. Um, we, I, I would expect the turnout among young people to be relatively low as it is historically. There's a variety of reasons for that. There's a big distinction, for example, between young 
uh, resident citizens versus, for example, college students who are away from home. It's very hard to get a ballot either in the place where your family lives or where you're now residing on a campus. Um, so, uh, and, and we also believe that voting is a habitual form of behavior, that you learn to be a voter. So obviously when you're younger and you don't have much experience, it's harder to get into the system. So all of this supports the notion that relatively speaking, the turnout among young people is lower than it is among uh, older citizens. Michael, I have a question. Uh, and that is about the Supreme Court getting involved in the election because uh, I, I believe one of our candidates said that, you know, it, it's going to go to the Supreme Court uh, it did go to the Supreme Court in Florida, although when you look at the, uh, the, the law about the election process, it doesn't include the Supreme Court, as far as I understand. So could, could you explain uh, what role the Supreme Court might play or what does happen if it's a contested election? I guess those are two separate questions. Yeah, first of all, uh, we expect the election to be highly contested. Both parties have uh, amassed substan substantial teams of lawyers uh, to, um, to look at the handling of ballots, the counting of ballots, the certification of the results. There is no federal law that regulates elections because we don't have federal elections, uh, uh, except insofar as uh, the presidential, uh, the federal elections are held on the Tuesday after the first Monday in, of November in even numbered years. But all of the contestation will be about local and state regulation. Um, it, a case could get to the Supreme Court uh, by going up through the normal uh, process, uh, but it would be about how to interpret a state law. So in Florida, the case was essentially about should they keep counting or should they stop? And the Supreme Court said, if the Supreme Court of Florida said stop, then, you know, should stop. Um, the contest in 2020 could be about signatures. It could be about the dates by which uh, local jurisdictions will accept ballots how many days after the election, for example. Um, so I think it's possible if the Republicans contest the counting regulations, it'll be to cut off uh, the tabulation of mail, mail votes, ma mail and ballots, and probably on the basis of the date that they were postmarked or received. Um, and so it would, if it got that far, it would be about interpretation of those elements of the local law. Okay. So, uh, but otherwise what, what would happen if it, if it is contested, it, it goes to the house. Is that correct? And can you, that, that's gets kind of complicated. I know that, uh, and that's at the electoral level. If, it, if they don't reach a, 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 a decision. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a little difficult to speculate about that, but let, let's talk about one easy case where the two candidates get the same number of electoral votes. So there's no clear winner in the Electoral College. Then I believe it would go to the House. It would be the new House that would make a decision. The House would vote by states that is one vote per state. So the division of the state delegations is very important. And the, and the winner could be determined by the House under that circumstance. I, I, I believe that's very unlikely. But uh, in the last uh, week or 10 days, Joe Biden made a visit to Michigan. He went to Grand Rapids, which would ordinarily be a very unusual place for a Democratic candidate to visit, except that there's an open house race in the Grand Rapids area that could um, affect the 
partisan distribution of the House delegation from the state of Michigan. And I think we'll see some travel by not, not much because they can't afford uh, these kind of uh, di digressive trips. But we could see some travel by both Biden and Trump in the last two and a half weeks uh, that could be related to House outcomes and state delegations, looking at the possibility of a, a, a House involvement. Uh, Eileen, are you still out there? You had a question from Mike. I don't know if it's been answered. Uh, don't hear Eileen anymore. How about Bill? No, Kipper? she's there. She's oh, there. She's okay, go ahead, Eileen. Yeah. I, I did unmute myself a little late. Um, yeah, our group of Janice Costa and Sharon Townsend and I um, had what two. A nice group, by the way. Some of my favorite people all in one group. Great. <laughs> I enjoyed it. So uh, we had two questions. We wanted to know, um, and you have kind of answered this, Michael, how many, how many voting, how much do you predict the voting will be absentee or early, the combination of early, prior to the election day uh, voting? And then the second thing is the big, you know, $64,000 question, how do we increase turnout in the last two and a half weeks? Uh, so I think I, I think I did give the answer to the first part, right, in the right. sense that we think it's about we think the majority, maybe up to sixty percent of the votes, will be cast early. Right. And that is, you know, primarily attributable to the uh, COVID pandemic. Um. I'm sorry. Ask me the second part again. Um, how do we increase turnout in the yeah. last half weeks? Well, you know, there's a very interesting thing going on, uh, which is actually based upon a series of experiments conducted by political scientists. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been exposed to these advertisements about plan your vote, but <laughs> there's a series of experiments that have been conducted that show that if you make a mental plan about a particular kind of behavior, you're more likely to follow through with that behavior. Uh, there, there's a, a, a political scientist and experimentalist who was at Yale, who's now at Columbia, uh, Don Green, who, who has uh, sponsored, who, who conducted this research. And the, and the Democrats have bought into this entirely. And so all of this messaging about plan your vote is to get people to commit to whatever plan, just to make a plan, and then to follow through. Um, there are other elements of this kind of uh, uh, effort. You know, Chuck has been involved in a, an experiment to get people to contact their friends and encourage them to vote. Be, you know, be, because there won't be uh, a lot of what we think of or used to describe as electioneering, people walking in the neighborhood, going door to door, knocking on the door, uh, leaving literature behind. That's not expected to be a big element of this campaign, but this kind of indirect contact and also the ad campaign to plan uh, should be very important. Michael, one of the uh a uh, strategy I read about in the Times, uh, I'll give a plug to the Times because my son is an editor there now, so I, I could uh, legitimately plug that, uh, that institution. But uh, the idea of when people have voted to, to ask them to text three people who they think may not have voted yet to go out and vote. Uh, have, have you been familiar with that strategy? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an extension of you know, the personal network. Yeah. Um, uh, concept and um, it's it's uh, it's the use of you know peer pressure, social pressure, uh, in relation also to expectations about what uh, uh, appropriate behavior would be in the context of an election. Okay. Uh, Jeff Holden, you've got a question out there.
Yes, my question was just looking at the debates. Uh, it dawned on me as I was watching first presidential debate that the moderator was was not keeping control. And it would seem that with the electronics of today that they could have easily said, okay, beforehand, here are the rules. If you get off point, if you start cutting in the other persons, we're going to mute you and take the camera off of you. And I'm surprised that that wasn't invoked even in the vice presidential debate. And I wondered if you had any thoughts as to why that may be. And is it that the these debates are just looking for TV ratings in a circus? Or is it that they weren't prepared? Well, well, actually, I think there's another explanation. Um, in the debates leading up to 1984, which would be 60, 76, 80, um, the debates were organized uh, by the parties and they required an act of Congress uh, to um, eliminate the equal time provision for the debates so that some some candidates could be excluded from participation. But then after uh, starting in the 80s, uh, the League of Women Voters and then the Commission on Presidential Debates took over the administration of the events, set up the, um, the rules for participation, which have to be negotiated every uh, cycle with the main candidates. They adopt a rule uh, which is part of the maintenance of the power and the primacy of the two major parties that, for example, if you don't have a certain level of support in the polls, you can't participate in the debates. So uh, what happens is there's a negotiation about the rules. Both candidates and parties agree to the rules and then the debates are held. Um, the rules don't include a cutoff, a mic cutoff. And um, so the moderator is essentially powerless in that circumstance to, cu to, cut off the, to cut off the mic. After the first debate this year, you know there was some conversation about control of the mic in the second debate were it to be held and uh, and Donald Trump in particular uh, disagreed about that and, and uh, said that he wouldn't participate under that rule change. He, you know, he would have called that a rule change. So uh, it's a, the debates are a system that's designed to advantage the two major party candidates to minimize the participation of others. And um, it's not designed, the rules aren't organized for a strong moderator or the use of, you know, advanced technical uh, uh, apparatus. Um, Mike, I, I'm going to wrap up. We're, we're already over time and we still have lots of questions out there. And uh, I, I think people could post and maybe you could take a look at these. And if you have any opportunity, Mike, uh, to, to respond or if people could email you at the university, your, your university email, that would be great. Maybe we could post that. But I just want to say um, thank you very much. And also, uh, you know, I'm kind of excited about the level of uh, involvement in this election uh, on both sides. I mean, it, it may be, you know, we have our we're, we're divisiveness, but I have to say I've never seen American democracy so alive, uh, you know, in, in the weeks before an election, whatever has happened, it's really got people engaged and thinking about it and talking about it and attending these seminars. And uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are about that. I mean, are you negative or are you positive about democracy? What do you see going on here? Uh, well, I would say I'm concerned about democracy. Um, the, this is, possibly one of the most important elections we've had uh, in recent history because of what's at stake uh, in the sense that um, we, we have an incumbent president who is a norm breaker 
and who has a view about the role of the executive uh, uh, that is very unusual and I think distorting of the basic principles uh, of the separation of powers and uh, the organization, organization of our government in three parts. So the, the level of activity I think is high because um, people are, uh, are thinking about, you know, what difference it makes who gets elected. And there are people with very strong beliefs on both sides. And uh, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in high turnout, you know, higher than average turnout. Um, and I think it'll be very, I think it'll be very con uh, consequential as we, when we look back at this later in, in terms of American history. I appreciate it, Mike. Very, very, very uh, thoughtful and uh, informative presentation. Uh, appreciate what you're doing. And uh, we're, if, you, if it's okay with you, we're going to post this on, um, uh, on online so people could take a look at it and uh, people uh, can uh, comment on it. And uh, I'll do that on Monday where, uh, where I'll post on the Dr. Rob newsletter uh, this, this presentation and the comments. And uh, Thank you all for participating. We had a very high level of, uh, of involvement here. Uh, we had about 60 people on board at one point and uh, every, about, we, about half of those are still on. So that's, that's very good for, uh, for a Zoom on a Friday morning. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, maybe we'll talk to you after the election. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks for inviting me.